Awesome. Thanks, Kendra. So on behalf of the National Child Passenger Safety Board, thank you for joining us for the CEU webinar, Transporting the Littlest Passengers, and happy Child Passenger Safety Week, everyone. Today's speakers are National Child Passenger Safety Board members Brittany Lombard and Marie Snodgrass, along with my good friend and safety advocate manager with Good Baby International, Sarah Haverstick. I'm James Fitzpatrick, the current community engagement representative on the National Child Passenger Safety Board and thrilled to be here with everyone today for this amazing presentation. Uh, we do have planned time at the end to answer questions, so please enter your questions in the Q&A box. Flip to the next slide, please. Thank you. As a reminder, attendees are requested to not participate in this webinar if you are operating a motor vehicle. The webinar will be recorded and you can listen to the recording when you safely arrive at your destination. The recording will be posted to carseateducation.org within one to two business days, but Kendra is always faster than that, so it should be up there very speedy as always. For the child passenger safety technicians in attendance, the presentation qualifies for one continuing education or CEU credit. Attendance on this webinar is required for at least 45 minutes for the CEU credit. Proof of attendance will be emailed 24 hours after the webinar. So please join me in welcoming Brittany, Marie, and Sarah. Great. Thanks, James. I'm actually going to kick it off for everybody. So let me share. So hi, everybody. I'm Sarah Haverstick. Uh, really happy to be here with everyone. I'm kicking us off today talking about using conventional restraints for some of our smallest passengers. So I thought this was an oldie but a, a goodie graphic. So those that have been in the field for a little bit may recognize this from previous uh, certification courses. But why do we need to think about newborn positioning as something that's a little bit different it's because, you know, our babies are born with these disproportionately large, heavy heads and a musculoskeletal system that's still developing. So they need us to place their head in the proper position so that they can maintain their airway because they cannot do that for themselves. Uh, so I always loved this image of, you know, here's our baby's head and the size of that child's head as they continue to grow. For today's purposes, I'm going to mostly talk about infant car seats, but just wanted to say from the beginning, you know, we have two different options, obviously, a rear facing only or an infant car seat or a convertible or all in one, some type of multi mode that has a rear facing capacity. Either of those can be options from birth. When we're talking about the smallest occupants, I generally find that starting with that rear facing only or infant car seat can sometimes be the better option because they are really only designed with infants in mind, where their larger multi-mode counterpart is designed for a much broader range of children. So from today's presentation, you'll see that I'm mostly going to be calling out features that are specific to infant car seats, some of which probably would apply to some of these all-in-ones or convertibles, but the examples I'm going to show are all from infant car seats. And I just wanted to say this sort of as this disclaimer from the beginning, obviously you could still use that convertible or all-in-one, uh, but either one of those are options. We're really going to focus in on that rear facing only today. And I'm really going to focus on features and some of those features of conventional restraints that can be really beneficial for our smaller occupants. And I want to kind of start at the top with the headrest. And I pulled a number of examples here. So headrests come in all kinds of shapes and sizes and with different thicknesses and different varieties. Um, every brand kind of does their own thing. Some of these headrests are integrated into that car seat. Some of them are removable. Sometimes they're optional, sometimes they're required. It's really important to understand what you're working with and what is in front of you. But in addition, if you're working with a smaller infant, you really need to be critical of these extra head support pieces and how that might impact the positioning of the infant that you're working with. Recognizing that sometimes even just a very thin head pad, an additional piece behind the child's head could be enough to push their, their chin forward and put them in a chin to chest situation where their airway isn't well protected. So let's look at a couple examples of these specifically. 
Uh, this is the Kleck Ling. So they have a headrest here. Uh, this headrest previously has been optional and listed in instructions as something that is optional. Currently, any product that has been manufactured after January 31st of 2024, the headrest is now required. It has to be there at all times. So as always, really important to review product instructions, even on car seats that you think you're really familiar with, that you've worked with a few times before, things can change. And certainly right now, and this is outside the scope of what we're really talking about today, but with the regulatory changes that are happening, there are a lot of things that are changing. So it's always important to double check those instructions. Here's another example. This is the Nuna Pippa Air RX. Uh, they note here that the head and the body supports can be used as necessary to help with a snug fit for smaller infants. Uh, they give some specific positioning instructions as well, uh, but they're just used as necessary. So it's not required. There's no specific time frame. It's just as necessary to help improve fit. Moving a little further down to the head, to the body pillows or infant inserts, different brands, again, use different names for these items. And sometimes there are requirements around when they can be used or when they must be removed. So in this case, this is everybody's favorite KeyFit 30 from Kiko. So I think most technicians are aware that this newborn positioner or that body pillow that they include here um, is used for infants who weigh between 4 and 11 pounds it has to remove or has to be removed from the product after 11 pounds. I personally get a lot of questions about this one. So this is the Evenflow Light Max. We have different designs. We have a lot of different models of Light Max and some different designs and separate head and body pillows. This one is very common in our travel systems. That's one single body pillow. Uh, I get a lot of questions about, well, when am I supposed to remove it? because we don't ever list a, a weight limit and many brands do provide a weight limit. So I get that question frequently and just wanted to call out that in instructions, we note that this is an optional head or and or body pillow. In this case, just that one single body pillow. It's optional. We try to make sure that is stated anytime we have no requirements around that product, it is optional for use. Then we have harness pads and harness pads are, you know, a pretty common feature on many car seats. And I really loved how Up a Baby incorporated this information in their product instructions. So this is the Mesa V2. They talk about how that harness needs to be snug, but what I highlighted at the bottom, for smaller babies, it is recommended to remove the harness pads for a more secure fit. So I know I've incorporated that into a number of our how-to videos that we have done with Evenflow as well. Sometimes those harness pads, even the ones that are designed for that infant car seat, when we're working with a much smaller infant, an infant that's on like the minimums of the minimums um, provided in that infant car seat for use, so they just don't have a lot of torso. There's not a lot of space to work with. So sometimes you really do need to remove that harness cover for at least a little bit of time so that you can get the chest clip in the correct position. It also, I often teach families, go ahead and remove the harness cover those first few rides just so you get used to how that harness should look and feel and how you're checking for that snug harness up at the shoulders, how what it feels like to be snug, because it's really hard to check at the shoulders. Again, even for an average size infant, it can be hard to check in that area when you also have harness pads on. Uh, so I think it's it's sometimes just a good practice in the beginning while families are getting used to it, but certainly for our smaller occupants, it helps to remove those harness pads so you can really ensure that chest clip is up in the area across the chest at the armpit level where it belongs. Uh, then a little bit further down on our harness, sometimes you see products that allow for buckle shortening. So you've got that buckle between baby's legs. Often there are adjustment positions. One of the things to call out with the buckle in particular is that, I, at least I know for our brand, we often, at least in the Light Max series that you see on screen, we have three different buckle positions, an inner, a middle, and an outer. 
we typically ship the product in the middle position because from our work with kid fits and, and work in the field, we know that that is going to work well for most average size newborns. So it means families wouldn't have to, most families wouldn't have to make an adjustment right at birth. However, if you're working with a, a smaller infant, you may need to then make that adjustment. So I call that out to say, always double check. And I think buckle positions in particular, often you can just flip that infant carrier upside down and very easily see those buckle slots and understand what adjustment options you might have. So always make sure you're adjusting into the innermost option for a smaller infant. But then if a brand allows you to shorten that buckle, it provides even better positioning for those smallest occupants. So when I say shorten the buckle, I mean, think of what a buckle looks like. So, you know, you've got that plastic buckle portion at the top. You generally have some webbing. And then often the buckle is secured with a metal anchor plate at the bottom. On the light max that you see on screen here, Normally with the buckle in just a, a typical position, it goes straight from the buckle where you can press the red button to release down to the anchor plate in a straight line and the anchor plate is nested on the bottom surface of that car seat. So underneath the shell of the car seat, that's where the anchor plate rests. When we shorten the buckle, we take that anchor plate and we route it up to the next open slot. So then it ends up being anchored on the inside shell surface of that car seat rather than underneath the car seat shell. So instead of being straight up and down like a letter I or a lowercase l, you end up, I call it a J route. So you end up making more of a J with the webbing on that buckle. Not only does it shorten the buckle a little bit, but that then changes where the harness is going to engage with the child's hips. So it, it just provides a different fit. What I've called out down at the bottom of the screen is it's important to note that if brands allow this, number one, they're going to include it and tell you that. But number two, sometimes it is a weight limited position. So in this case, with these infant car seats, we say you cannot use this for a child that weighs more than eight pounds. So that's another important piece of information to look for in product instructions. Next up, some of those aftermarket things that we talk about as sometimes okay, but you know, sometimes they're not. It's really dependent on the brand. So I'm talking about side rolls or the roll that you can put around the buckle, commonly referred to as a crotch roll, like a small piece of or a small washcloth that you could use to fill in the gap there. So let's talk about these things for just a minute and why you may or may not want to choose to use them. First and most importantly, you it is never necessary to immobilize an infant's head. It is okay and generally preferred for that infant to have the ability to move their head from side to side. And even if they go from ear to shoulder, side to side, that is generally okay. So when you're doing a side roll in particular, I think you need to weigh the risk of having that blanket up near the baby's face. So side rolls can certainly be helpful when we're trying to maintain midline positioning for a smaller infant in particular, you know, trying to encourage them to stay kind of in the center so that harness can be nicely positioned and nice and snug on them. What I often remind technicians, especially hospital-based techs that work with families all the time, you are really comfortable rolling up that blanket to be that nice tight side roll. It's something that you do day in and day out. You understand that proper positioning. You understand the risk of that blanket becoming unrolled and coming across baby's face. Is that something that when you do it, the parent understands why you're doing it and can they replicate that same tight blanket roll? For our, from our perspective at Evenflow in our FAQ, we do allow you to use these side rolls, but we encourage you only to place them from the shoulders and below so that really you're thinking about the midline positioning, but keeping clearance around baby's neck and head. My other concern is when it comes up closer to the neck, what if it 
inadvertently ends up behind baby's head, then you're sort of doing the opposite of what we want. If that side roll ends up behind the head, you could, again, inadvertently be pushing the baby's head forward and be compromising that airway again. So my big message here is that side rolls, if allowed by the brand, can be okay and can help maintain that midline positioning. But I really encourage you to make sure you're educating that family that you're working with very well on why you're doing it and how to do that safely. And I really encourage you to keep those blankets away from baby's head so you don't have any concerns about risk for pushing baby's head forward anymore or covering baby's face with a blanket. Crotch rolls may also really help prevent slouching. So certainly if there is a gap between baby and the buckle, it can be helpful to fill in that, that area with that little bit of washcloth to prevent baby from slumping down if the brand allows. So most importantly here, always check the product instructions to understand what is or is not allowed by that specific manufacturer. And I would encourage you, if you find that the brand says, no, you're not allowed to do this, but you have a baby where you're like, gosh, this would be really helpful, take some pictures as allowed and set, reach out to the advocate for that brand. Let them know what you're seeing. Show them the pictures and ask if they have any input or feedback. If brands don't see that you're struggling in a certain area, we can't do anything to help with it either. So reach out and at least ask the questions and, and then you'll hear straight from the brand what they would be comfortable with. So then I want to segue for just a moment to talk about, you know, some characteristics of some of these smaller infants. So when we say low birth weight infant, generally that's described as an infant that at birth weighs less than 2,500 grams, which is, you know, five pounds, eight ounces. Um, this, according to the Children's Hospital, Hospital of Philadelphia, uh, the low rate of low birth weight infants in the United States has been increasing. So right now it's just over 8% of newborn babies in the U.S., Premature infants are infants that are born before 37 weeks gestational age. And again, one in 10 babies in the U.S. are born preterm. So what we found is, you know, we've heard more and more from some of our hospital partners that medicine it can do amazing things. And often even these very tiny babies are thriving and are actually ready to go home before they hit four pounds. But generally, most of our infant car seats start at four pounds. So it's like where we were like 15, 20 years ago, where most infant car seats started at five pounds. But then we started to hear from hospital partners, but wait, we have these babies at four pounds that are really ready. So we took that to our engineering team and said, really, like, what is the difference here in a pound? Three pounds versus four pounds. What is our concern? And in general, our concern is not the mass of the child, because that's really not going to change in any way between three and four pounds, how that car seat is going to perform. However, there is quite a bit of difference in the anatomy and the size of a three pound infant versus a four pound infant. So from us, at least at Evenflow, our biggest concern was actual fit of the infant. Can we get these very tiny babies to realistically fit in the infant car seats that we have available? Uh, is that is that something that you know we could put out and and have an expectation of use? We also don't have any dummies that are really this size that we can use for crash testing. So trying to think through new ways where we can be utilizing computer-aided design and, and different types of computer-based testing to better understand how these smaller occupants um, both fit in the car seat and interact with the crash forces is important to us. So on the fit front, uh, we rely on hospital partners to really work collaboratively with us to help. So I wanted to just show a couple of pictures of what we're looking for. And unfortunately, I've told the team, we really need like hot pink uh, when we go and do these infant fits so we can distinguish better between harnesses and soft goods. But inevitably, the soft goods are black, as you see here. So we have a black shell, a car seat, and a black harness system here. Um, but we look at the hips. The hips are an important area to us. We want to make sure that we can get that harness and the buckle nice and snug in this area. Certainly, we look at shoulder positioning. We want to see that we can get that shoulder placed at or below um, that shoulder. 
This is another example of shoulder. Most importantly, we're looking at how is the head positioned in that car seat. So really keyed in. I can't show you those pictures because it'd be too hard to see with blocking out that infant's face for privacy. Uh, but we spend a lot of time looking and judging how is the infant's head and neck positioned when they're in the car seat. Uh, we do have a car seat now that is labeled at three pounds. So that's the even flow shift dual ride. We did a lot of this work with families up front and with some hospitals. We have a full checklist of premature infant use, including a lot of these things that we've talked about today as tips and tricks for better positioning, because we wanted to make sure families felt supported in their use with these very, very tiny occupants. So that's what I have to share today. Uh, now I'm going to toss it over to Brittany. All right. Oops. Let me just share my slides here real quick. Okay. There we go. All right. So for those that I have uh, that I have not met yet, uh, my name is Brittany Lombard, and I am the child passenger safety advocate on the board, and I work in a healthcare setting. Uh, I'm going to start today just by talking about the basics of what is a car seat tolerance screening. And at its essence, this is a test that's going to monitor an infant's oxygen level, their heart rate, uh, and their breathing for a period of time in their car seat. Because when infants are in this semi-upright position, they can experience cardiorespiratory instability. So doing the car seat tolerance screening has been a recommendation by the AAP since 1991, at least for those infants under 37 weeks gestational age. As the AAP says, we can use our crash test dummies to crash test car seats, but we can't replicate the airway and tone variables that we see in preterm infants. And that's where this test comes in. So we can see the actual infants in their seats and how they respond. And in 2015, NHTSA convened a work group with the AAP, NHTSA, the National Safety Council, the National Child Passenger Safety Board, and the Children's Hospital Association. And they came up with a list of recommendations for, for hospitals on what their policy should include. So it doesn't say the details of exactly what they should write in their policy, but it says that their policy should cover how they're training the staff, which staff members are able to conduct the test, what equipment they're going to use, the importance of using the infant's own car seat and the correct recline. They recommend adding a length of time for the test, a threshold for what a failure would be, uh, how to educate caregivers on the parameters of the test, the purpose of the test, and then of course, how to duplicate those things in your own vehicle. And it should include the need for follow-up testing for families that go home in a car bed and need to transition back into an infant car seat. The AAP has a little bit of additional guidance with a little bit of more specifics. This policy was last reaffirmed in 2018, so it has not been reaffirmed in the last several years, but it is the newest policy available. And in addition to what was listed on the last slide, the AAP recommends a duration of 90 to 120 minutes or the duration of travel for the family. Uh, they definitely recommend doing it for premature infants under 37 weeks gestational age, but they also suggest con considering other health conditions, uh, including Down syndrome, hypotonia, uh, neuromuscular disorders, pierrot Ben sequence, and congenital heart surgery. And they also include a recommendation that if a child is going to go home in a car bed to replicate the car seat tolerance screening in the car bed or perform a car bed tolerance screening as well. So then when do we go to a car bed? Uh, unfortunately, there's not an exact answer here and we really are going to rely on each organization to follow the policy that they have outlined for car bed use. However, there are two basic circumstances where we would look for a car bed. One would be when an infant cannot tolerate a conventional rear-facing car seat. And again, cannot tolerate is gonna be something that the hospital should define in their policy. How many times are they gonna test? What are their uh, requirements for a pass or a fail? And the second instance is if the provider deems it medically necessary for positioning for the infant. 
A lot of times CPSTs will wonder if they are able to help with a car bed if they have not taken the safe travel for all children course. And we really want to look at our good, better, best model here, where best would be to find a CPST who has completed the stack enrichment course to help with a car bed. But in the good, better, best model, CPSTs are able to help with car beds. We would ask them to do what you are all trained to do in your regular work, which is to read manuals and reach out to manufacturers if you have any questions. When we look at the definitions from NHTSA uh, in FMVSS, the definition of a car bed is a child restraint system designed to restrain or position a child in the supine or prone position on a continuous flat surface. In terms of the terms as they will come up on future slides, supine means lying on an infant's back, prone means lying on the belly face down, and the term side lying can mean lying on either side, but when we're talking about car beds, the options we have that allow side lying do specify that the infant needs to lie on their right side. It does also sometimes come up whether car beds actually pass FMVSS standards, and the answer is they do. There are some specific things within FMVSS relating to car beds in terms of how they're tested and how they have to pass. So for example, the dummy's head and torso do have to be retained uh, within the car bed throughout the test. They are only required to be tested with a lap only belt. Now that doesn't mean you can only use them with a lap only belt, that's just the testing that's required to pass FMVSS. That third point there basically says that they are designed to be used perpendicular to the vehicle seat, so they are side-facing car beds. The instructions do have to specify that the child's head needs to be near the center of the vehicle. And finally, when they are testing the car beds, they are to place the dummy in a supine position. Again, that doesn't mean they can only be used in that position. That is just how the crash testing has to be. Hopefully many of you have heard about the side impact standards that are going into effect in June of 2025. That will be FMVSS 213A, and it will apply to all child restraint systems that include a weight up to 40 pounds or a height up to 43 inches. However, car beds are exempt from this part of the standard. And we have three current car beds on the market, so I'm gonna go over the options for those. The first one here is the Angel Ride car bed, and this is from Merit Manufacturing. You can see it goes up to nine pounds and up to 21 and a half inches. So this one is great for the itty bitties. They don't specify a minimum height or weight. And it has a three point harness system. So two shoulders and the buckle strap between the child's legs. You can see there are no hip straps on this car bed. They do not have an option for lower anchors. So as I mentioned, FMVSS only requires crash testing with the seatbelt system. So they do not have to provide lower anchors on a car bed the way that they do on a conventional car seat. So this can be done with a lap only or a lap and shoulder belt. It is able to lie infant supine on their back like the picture you see here, but with a, a provider order, it can also be used side lying or prone on their belly. Couple pictures from the manual here. So you can see in that first photo, that is the side lying infant. You can see that it specifies right side only. And that's because the angel ride only has a front and a back. You can't turn the, the car bed around. And you'll notice that in the middle photo, it's saying that it cannot be installed on the driver's side seats. And that's because it would put the child's head away from the center of the vehicle. So these are important things to keep in mind if a family has multiple children that travel in a car or if they only have one caregiver because the instructions do specify that if the child is positioned side lying or on their belly, there does need to be a caregiver buckled next to them to monitor at all times. The next option that we have is the Dream Ride, and this comes from Safety First, which is part of Durrell Juvenile Group. 
the seat goes from five to 20 pounds and up to 26 inches. So it will last a little bit longer than the Angel Ride, but you can see since it has the five pound minimum, it may not fit those itty bittier babies. It also has a three point harness system and the seat does come with lower anchors. So you can actually choose between a seatbelt or a lower anchor installation. It can be used supine or with a doctor's orders. It can be used prone for an infant on their belly. It's also important to know that this can take up more than one seating position. So you're going to need to factor in the family circumstance and the vehicle they have. And with this car bed, you actually can move the installation loops to either side of the car bed, meaning you can turn the baby's head toward the center of the vehicle on either side. So it can be installed in any seating position as long as that infant's head is facing the middle of the vehicle. And finally, we have the Hope car bed. This is also from Merit Manufacturing. It goes from four and a half to 35 pounds and 13 to 29 inches. But the instructions do specify that if the child is able to bend their legs, it can actually go above 29 inches. It has a three point harness with a cummerbund, but it also has a restraint bag with a cummerbund. So there are different options on how to restrain the child in the car bed. This one also is a seatbelt installation only, and it is going to take two adjacent seating positions and two seatbelts to install. So it is important to make sure that the family using this has two seatbelts positions available next to each other. It can be used supine and with a doctor's order, it can be used prone or side lying on the infant's right side as well. And taking a look at the restraint options for the child, there are quite a few, so it's important to make sure you have the right option available. So the top left photo that you see is the restraint bag with the cummerbund. You can see it kind of looks like an infant sleep sack, and that restraint bag is actually harnessed uh, with webbing to the car bed itself, and that is what restrains the child. And then the cummerbund velcros over the top of it. That comes in two sizes based on weight. On the right, you see the three-point harness with the cummerbund, and you can see that cummerbund goes underneath the harness there, and the buckle strap is adjustable in length. And then at the bottom, you'll see the side-lying uh, restraint bag and cummerbund, and that is a separate piece. You can't just turn the regular one to the side. You do need that special side lying uh, restraint bag if you're using it side lying. Uh, there are also a number of other accessories, including a wedge to make sure that the Hope bed lies flat in a vehicle. And now that we are using a car bed, how do we know when to discontinue use of the car bed? So as mentioned earlier, the work group that NHTSA convened did make a recommendation that there should be a policy in place on how to go back to an infant's car seat, which would look like another car seat tolerance screening on the end of the journey in the car bed to make sure that that infant can now tolerate that car seat and use their uh, conventional car seat going forward. And I am going to hand it over to Marie. Thank you. I think I'm there. Can you see my screen, guys? Yes, but you're not sharing your slides yet. So just start the slideshow and then it'll work. Um, perfect. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now I can't see you guys. Um, all right. So going back here to my first slide. Oh, going back to my first slide. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, I am, uh, Marie Snodgrass. I am the, um, injury prevention and healthcare representative on the board. And I work at CS Mott Children's Hospital in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to tie this up with 
um, talking about educating our frontline staff and our caregivers about transporting our littlest passengers. And I think I realized that I probably could have done like a whole day presentation on this when I was trying to pare it down for these few minutes that I get. So I'm going to hopefully not talk too fast, but I'm going to try to include a lot of information, I think, in this little bit. Um, one of the key points I obviously want to mention is that um, for all of us that work in healthcare, I think we realize that we operate under the good, better, best um, mantra, I think, every day because we strive for best, but we sometimes realize that our uh, our circumstances and our environment might limit us, um, the time we get with patients and um, the time that we have uh, to take advantage of, you know, our, our teachable moments and our, our time with our, our families and our and our patients are is sometimes a little bit limited. And so I think making sure that we take advantage of that is, is important, but we don't always get to maybe do the um, entire appointment the way that we were trained when we went through our certification course. Um, but we try to take advantage of the time that we have and get as much um, in before patients discharge as we possibly can. And so we really try to, we strive our best, but sometimes we, we end up with the good or better scenario, just making sure that they get information before they leave us. Um, so just want to kind of show you a little bit about who I am. I think that this will kind of put things in perspective because I know that when sometimes when we present and you're hearing somebody from a hospital, you're like, oh, I wonder how this compares to where I'm coming from. Um, so the hospital that that I um, work at is, is, I think, fairly large, but compared to some of yours, I'm sure is it's maybe not, but um, we see about 42,000 ED visits a year. We have 350 inpatient beds. Um, we do have a birthing center within our hospital with 53 private labor and delivery rooms and deliver about 5,500 babies a year. So, um, and I think when I hired in pre-COVID, we were at about 3,500. Um, so that has risen significantly um, in the past few years. So, um, something to kind of make note of, and we'll, I'll kind of touch on that in a little bit. We have um, a level four NICU with 59 private NICU rooms, and um, not all of those babies that are in our NICU come, are born at our hospital, come from our labor and delivery floor, but actually uh, about 25% are transferred from another hospital. On top of that, we are a level one trauma center, so our injury prevention program doesn't just do buckle up and doesn't just do child passenger safety, but it is probably the biggest portion of what we do and who we see um, just by the nature of, of who we are. Um, so just wanna kind of set the scene for you there. Uh, our latest trends, I would say, is um, increasing, you know, like we had increasing numbers coming in probably since COVID, I would say, but most recently, the last couple of years, we've definitely had an increased census um, in our hospital. We are seeing more higher risk pregnancies and deliveries and uh, higher acuity patients. Therefore, because of the higher, I think, risk pregnancies, it's it's causing higher acuity patients that are being cared for on units other than in our NICU. Um, because we have so many high need patients, there's not enough beds in our NICU. So what we are seeing is a trend that is more... Um, uh, I don't want to say disturbing, but a little bit stressful sometimes is that other units are caring for babies with higher needs um, that they're not necessarily used to caring for, or in the past, maybe they didn't have to care for. Uh, so that's interesting and something that that we've had to kind of adapt to and had to be, we have to be a little bit more aware of. Um, and I'll touch on that, I think, a little bit more in just a second as well. Um, just to let you know, our program specifically, again, we've got three FTEs. Uh, we are all child passenger safety um, technicians, and well, we're all instructors. Um, we try to make sure we have somebody on staff every day uh, that's able to address the patients um, and appointments. We do do our appointments, or we do see patients by appointment only so that we can try to um, make the best use and be as efficient as we can with our time. We try to make sure that when we're in the hospital that we... Um, we do prioritize families that are discharging. Um, and because of that, we try to go in and um, beginning of each week specifically, but even each day we like to print out our NICU and our general peds census, because that tells us where the where the babies are um, that maybe are in those step down units or on, in the NICU that maybe aren't ready to go home today, but are getting closer to discharging. So we can plan out a little bit um, because we know that labor and delivery is, is fast. Um, a revolving door, right? And and so we need to make sure that we, when 
they request our services, we try to be available for them. Um, and, and therefore we try to kind of stagger and plan out these other appointments in a way that, that we have room for these, these revolving door families that are coming and going quickly in our, in our labor and delivery, um, uh, unit. <clears throat> we are a little bit different than a lot of programs in that we don't actually, in our own department, we don't handle special needs seating, just the education, um, uh, around installation. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. Our physical therapy and occupational therapy does the fitting to the um, special needs seats, and we kind of tag team with them. They are actually there longer in the day, um, and they're all also there over the weekends. So it makes way more sense for them to kind of own that piece than for us to, because we don't want to be responsible for holding up discharges um, and that and that kind of thing. So we work with them, but we don't actually own that. That makes sense. <clears throat> so when it comes to education, um, there's a few things that we like to really focus on. Uh, keeping our team available, making sure that we've got somebody in-house available and during those Monday through Friday uh, hours that we're open. And then what do we do about coverage over the weekends? What do we do about coverage on the holidays? Things like that. So we try to have other resources available. And what we've done is we've made um, uh, we've made some resources of our own and we've made resources available to our staff in our hospitals. Um, uh, we've got videos, we've got different educational handouts, we've got our website. We have tried to really kind of saturate uh, the, the hospital that we work within to make sure that there are resources available for the staff when we are not available um, because we can't be there 24 seven. We are not supported to be there 24 seven. Um, and so what we do is we try to make sure that we've got a kind of a contingency plan. We've got those um, resources available because we know babies are going to go home on days and times when we're not there. And we need to kind of have some of those, um, some of those things in place. Um, other things that we need to uh, think about is who can we work with? Who can we collaborate with uh, to make sure that they know about us, right? Um, this is my favorite picture. <laughs> If anybody works with child life, they're amazing. Um, and I feel like sometimes we, we're like them um, in that we're the, the weird ones that everyone's looking at, like, why are those people always playing with dolls? Um, but uh, yeah, that's us. Uh, we um, are constantly looking at who we can collaborate with, who we can work with in the hospital um, to make sure that we're disseminating and delivering the education the best way and through the best people. Um, I think that, uh, the, I don't, I don't, I don't think we're different in this way. Um, at least I did. I feel like when I was just at the kids emotion conference, I, I found other people that had similar experiences, but I still feel like after being in our hospital for 12 years, I run into people that'll constantly say, I didn't even know you guys existed. Oh my God. I didn't even know you were out there. I didn't know that there was an injury prevention program. I didn't know you guys did this, you know, and it's so frustrating. You're the best kept secret. The last thing we want to be is the best kept secret. So we're constantly looking for who in the units and who on the floors we can collaborate with, who can we connect with, be it the nurse educators, the discharge coordinators, social workers, um, the child life staff, different people that are in and out of the rooms that are providing education. Those are the people that we want to connect with. Those are the people that we want to get in with and that we want to make sure know who we are. They're going to be the ones to pull us in when they see something or they see a family who needs us. Um, networking. Who can, how do we find these people? How do we find the right people? Because I don't know about your places, but I feel like every floor and every unit in our hospital operates just a little bit different. Um, so attending the unit-based committee meetings, um, we have monthly resident trainings on our labor and delivery floor. That is amazing, getting in front of the residents like right away, right when they're starting their um, labor and delivery rotation is a great opportunity for us. And then eventually you start to realize that there are certain champions that really exist in each of these units or in each of these floors that will start calling, will start paging, will start reaching out to you and saying, hey, I really want you to come by and see this family or hey, I really find that there's um, an opportunity for you to come talk to this group and they'll start pulling you in. They'll start seeing the value. They'll start noticing that there's um, different opportunities for you. So the more you can kind of get in with some of these different um, 
these different pockets and different groups, you'll start identifying like, that's our champion. This is our champion. And you'll kind of figure out who, who those people are that are going to be the ones to pull you in um, when they find those, those little um, opportunities for you. And then I don't know about you guys, but I feel like we are constantly looking for financial support and ways to um, continue funding our program, funding car seats, funding, um, any kind of like outreach, any kind of materials that we create, um, translating the materials that we create, all of that, we need to um, we need to support it ourselves. So we uh, are constantly trying to figure out like through the hospital if there's a foundation or some philanthropic group that is um, that is there. Like those are things that we're constantly kind of just keeping our ear to the ground and trying to make sure that we're aware of and we're applying for different DEI grants or opportunities. They're always popping up and we're always ready for the next one. Um, another really important thing that we try to do when we're talking about when we're talking about education is making sure that we're very um, aware of the um, the cultural differences that may exist when it comes to certain um, groups within our uh, hospital, whether it be patients or staff, honestly. Um, we have a super diverse uh, community in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And so we we meet people from all over. Um, we've got a lot of refugees and we've got a lot of um, uh, immigrant families. And so they're coming and they're delivering their first baby at our hospital. We can assume that wherever they came from, um, that they had the same experiences around injury prevention or around um, car seat use and things like that. So we just need to be aware and we need to understand um, kind of where they're coming from and maybe tailor our approaches and our education around um, that understanding. We also need to make sure that we're aware of their language preferences and we need to be tying in um, interpreters whenever possible. Um, that is a, a huge uh, um, uh, priority of ours and we don't uh, take that lightly. We always wanna make sure that the family is fully understanding what it is that we're trying to convey and making sure that that uh, they don't have any questions for us. So this right here, I love to share. It's really, um, it's slightly outdated, but I still find it to be super relevant. So Dr. Macy um, used to work at the University of Michigan and now she's over in Chicago. Um, and she did a survey with families asking them where they go for their information regarding child passenger safety. Um, I always kind of chuckle a little bit at the first one because I wish this many family <laughs> read their instructions before they came to see us. Um, but uh, I think that uh, it's super telling that 68% of the families that were surveyed said that they go to their doctors or their nurses. Um, that to me is really important. And that's something that I convey to any staff that I'm training, um, any cl clinical staff, any residents, any medical students, nursing staff, anybody that I'm training within our hospital. Because what that tells me right there is that um, they, they value the knowledge that comes from those clinicians. Um, but it's also terrifying because not many of those clinicians really understand child passenger safety. And um, so if they say something, it's really hard for us. And uh, as somebody who's been doing this for 23 years, um, I can't undo something that's been said by, by somebody in a white coat or somebody with a stethoscope around their neck. Um, and so we really want to make sure that they understand the weight that they carry and that they don't overstep and that they don't speak about something that they don't actually have all the knowledge about. Um, so we stress really um, with each of these groups that that we are present to, to support them and to be that resource for them. And they don't need to try to do all of that. Um, they don't need to understand all of that, to learn all of that, to keep up on all of that, that we've got that for them and they can just refer families to us. So um, we, you know, I talked a little bit about the revolving door of uh, labor and delivery. Um, we all know they, they come and go in a very short amount of time. Because of that, and because of our staff issues with the time that we are present, um, we decided to create a child passenger safety advocate program within our hospital. Um, we actually have created this program specifically for our labor and delivery uh, um, postpartum nurses to be able to help patients within their unit that they're working with um, 
because of the fact that they come and go so fast. And what we were finding was that the families that are um, that are delivering at our hospital, often when they're asked at delivery or when they come in and you ask them if they have a question about a car seat, they will say no um, until they realize that they have a question about their car seat. And a lot of times it, it can be like right when they're walking out the door. I don't know exactly what I'm doing right now. Um, and if right now is at 5 p.m. or at 6 p.m. or 9 p.m. or on a Saturday or a Sunday, even if it's in the middle of the day, if our staff is booked up already and they're ready to walk out the door, we may not be able to be available to meet with them. So what we found was that we we were missing a lot of families and frustrating a lot of families because we were not available right then when they needed that when they needed us. So we created this program where we do training with the staff on that unit to be able to answer some questions um, and to be uh, some basically our champions on that unit. Um, but they're not CPSDs. They're only going to go through a four hour training. Um, and basically, they're going to kind of be a little bit of an extension or partner with our program um, to be able to just answer those questions and help families safely get their child in that seat, fitted into that seat before they leave. Um, the other thing that they, we found that's been really amazing about this program is not only are they answering questions that families have, but they're kind of catching some things and they've got a little bit of a relationship with that family at this point um, as they're leaving and they can address some things even when families aren't asking. Um, so it's been really helpful in that they're um, they're catching some things that they're noticing and addressing them with families before they leave um, and making those babies a little bit safer. So when we go into this advocate training, we make sure that it's super clear. They're going to have limited education on how to place the baby in a seat. They're going to be able to hopefully identify major misuse and intervene when they see it. They're going to still know how to refer to us and our program and that they're going to be comfortable saying, I don't know, because that's hard. It's hard for us. And even there are some times when we have to still say, I don't know, right? Um, they're never going to be after four hours a certified child passenger safety technician. They're never going to go to a car um, and they're never going to recommend anything about a seat or give an opinion about a seat. We all have opinions, right? When we walk into a room, you see a seat and you're like, oh, good. You think it in your head, but you never say it out loud. So we want to make sure that they understand that as well. Um, the topics that we cover, we go over types of seats. We go over, um, you know, if it's a convertible seat versus a um, going through quick. Um, convertible seat versus a rear facing only or infant seat. We go over all the parts of seats, um, proper fit. We've got a whole room full of seats basically when they walk in, all different types. So we wanna make sure that there's all the different adjuster types. We wanna make sure that there's no thread, re um, no re-thread harnessing. There's um, different uh, types of harness slots. There's different types of adjusters. Um, all the different things that we can think of, the things that drive us crazy and the things that we're really excited to see when they come in the, when they come in for an appointment, those are the things that we want to get in front of them. Um, we talk to them about inserts, the ones that come with seats and the ones that don't. Um, common misuse, red flags, you know, things that actually are, are red flags and things that aren't. You know, a seat might be a little dirtier than I would put my baby in, but a dirty seat isn't a, a dirty seat isn't a, a big red flag. And if it's got mold in it, yep, that's a big red flag. If it's got mouse poop in it, that's a big red flag. Um, you know, things like that. Uh, and then we make sure they have resources. One of the resources that we want to make sure that they have is a book that we have created um, that's called Preventing Injuries. And it is a like a basically a supplemental resource. It kind of reinforces everything that we've just talked about. It also has all the next steps. So it has all the child passenger safety stages in them. Um, and we've been really intentional when we created this book about having all the pictures of what to do and not what not to do. Uh, so none of the, you know, pictures of something really bad with a line through it. We want to have like all the do this, do this, do this kind of things. And then we didn't just stop with the English version. We went ahead and we got it translated into um, Spanish and Arabic. So we've got it in a couple different versions. Now, beyond that, we also created some other resources that are available at our hospital. Um, we created uh, some videos. We used to use the simple steps to child passenger safety and COVID taught us that was a really great video, um, super thorough. 
Um, but none of our families really were sitting through it. We had it on our Get Well Network, which is our in-house um, educational system and entertainment system in our patient rooms. And the good thing about that system is that we can actually, uh, we can track if somebody is assigned a video, if they watch it all the way through, if they start it and don't finish it, things like that. And what we found with that is pretty much people would start it and never finish it because it was like a 20 minute video. Um, so what we learned from that is that we really needed to make sure that we found out we could created something that was more concise. Um, and what we did was we created these videos that are under four minutes a piece. There's a rear facing, a forward facing, and one that's booster seats and seat belts. They're um, able to be assigned on the video on the video system or people can find them on their own. Um, and they're also on our YouTube channel. They started out in English and Spanish. We added American Sign Language. We also added Japanese, Arabic, and French. Here's just an example of our American Sign Language version. And then we really stress to everybody um, when uh, we're teaching our, our courses is that there's a there's so many great resources out there that are manufacturer specific. Um, so we really encourage when families have questions um, specific to their car seats, they should really go to their, their manufacturer's website um, and look for videos that are specific to that, that seat, that model, um, and, or even YouTube, but always make sure when they go to YouTube, where we always stress that you want to make sure that it's, that it's specifically your manufacturer's um, YouTube channel and not just some crazy person who's out there making up videos on seats. Um, but they're so helpful. They're straight to the point. They're very specific on, on the seats often that the family has. And so we think that these are amazing resources and we really want people to take advantage of the fact that they're out there. Um, so we always stress when we're doing our advocate training to the nurses and um, the staff that these are amazing resources. And since I have the system in the room that this is a great opportunity for them to you know pull this right up in their room and, and learn. And then I'm just gonna cut through this really quick, but teachable moments are something that we're just constantly trying to, you know, like look for and make sure that we're capturing, whether it be with our staff or our patients. So just kind of making sure that we're we're being clear when we're um, when we're delivering our education, that we're using the resources that are out there, you know, using the people that are out there and really listening when we're talking to the families. And ultimately, again, it's the good, better, best, right? We don't always get to, you know, have that full appointment from beginning to end, um, but we get as much as we can in and we make the most of every opportunity that we have. And I did like that speed version. So thank you so much for your time and I will give it back. Thank you. I'm gonna switch slides really quick. After I hide all the questions, okay. So I'm gonna jump in, um, close this out with the last few slides. We have a lot of questions and we're right at the top of the hour. So I'm gonna close out and then we'll go back to the questions if you guys are available to stay on for a little bit. We have two upcoming webinars, one in October. Um, NHTSA is presenting on product recalls and the process throughout the recall system. And then in a November, join us for the 2024 CPST certification update. And this one is geared more towards technicians. We had a few of the instructor ones. Those will continue to go on throughout the next several months. But this one is for you as CPSTs and what you need to know in the upcoming curriculum revision. We still have a few more days to join the National Child Passenger Safety Board. We are accepting applications for the Public Safety Fire EMS. These are due by um, September 30th. If you have any questions, please email me at secretariat at cpsboard.org. This position goes from May 2025 until May of 28. And then thank you. We will uh, um, record this and then post seat education. I will get it uploaded today, but it probably won't be ready for another day or two because we have a curriculum designer who comes in and makes all those really pretty product cards for us. So I am going to jump to the questions. All right, the first one um, I think is for you, Sarah, and I don't know what, what it is in reference to, but it says in January, 2024 ruling just for CLEC or all rear facing only. 
Uh, yes. So at the beginning of the presentation, I showed a slide with the Click Ling and a page from their product instructions. What I shared is an update from CLEC for the CLEC Ling that was as of that date in January of this year, um, that their instructions have changed. So even for CLEC, you will always review what is in the instructions that are in front of you. So if you're working with an older Ling and the instructions say the headrest is optional, then the headrest is optional, but that only applies to CLEC and it's specific to that product. So just a reminder to always review those product instructions. All right, the next one is for you as well. Is the light maxi still able to be used for three pound babies if they meet the height requirements? Yep, so light max is retroactively approved at three pounds and 15.7 inches. Um, we've also allowed use smaller in terms of height than that. Um, so if you're ever working with a kiddo that's below 15.7 inches above three pounds, just send me an email, send me details, um, and then potentially we could use our medical waiver in that situation. All right, and then Marie, we have a lot of questions for you and your books. Can those be shared with other agencies? I can't get off of, I can't, um, I can't show myself, um, but yes, um, they can be. Um, they're on our website, which is pediatrictrauma.org. You can download the, there's a PDF version. Um, so they're accessible to anybody who wants to um, have them. So please use them. The videos are there as well. Um, so we, anything we create, we, we make available to anybody who would like to, to share them or use them. Okay. And then there is a comment for me to put the secretariat email. I will pop that in the chat for everybody. Or if Brittany or Marie, if one of you want to put my email in there, you can, that'd be great. Um, are there any recommend recommended discharge or car seat changes for a baby with a fractured collarbone due to dystocia? Um, oh, my question is gone. If otherwise they are medically fine to go home. Brittany and Marie, do you want to answer that? Do you want me to answer it? I can try my best to answer. There okay. are not any specific recommendations that I have come across. If you know otherwise, I'd, I'd be happy to have you share. Yeah, a lot of times, um, if it's pretty severe, they need to go into car bed. The hope is great for that with the um, the, the bag, the zip up bag. Um, sometimes they can still go in a harness. Um, it depends on where that fracture is or where that dislocation is. It just depends on the baby and their, what they're able to tolerate. But I would start with the car seat if they're able to go in that. Um, oftentimes the harness fits right over. Okay. And then, um, Marie, do you want to put in your website in the chat also for the books? Yes, ma'am. We talked about birth weight. Do we consider discharge weight for babies? Brittany and Marie, do you want to answer that? Or do you want me to do it? So I can tell you what our policy is. We do the car seat tolerance screening within 48 hours of discharge. So we would go based off of the weight that they are at the time of discharge, but that I think is also going to be policy dependent. Yeah, so the high, um, before I went to the safety council, I have been in healthcare for the last 10 years, and I worked at two different large health organizations. Um, we used whatever dish, whatever weight they were that day for their car seat test. Um, we did not have a minimum weight to discharge in, and I think a lot of hospitals are that way. As long as they pass all the tests, they're medically stable, and they fit in their car seat, they're safe to go home. We do not have a minimum weight either. That would have been answered. Can the AAP educate doctors about referring patients to CPSTs? This one we actually just talked about, gosh, I want to say last week. Um, the AAP does have state chapters, so you can reach out to your state chapter um, and see what kind of information they are dispersing to their physicians. We also have our current AAP president is a child passenger safety technician instructor. Um, that's Dr. Ben Hoffman. He can be reached also on the AAP website and could be a resource as well. Just trying to go through them. They keep popping up. Um, this one here, I'm going to ask it and you guys can answer it as you see fit. 
What are the current thoughts on ATT or the CSTS? Under a certain weight, we had one attending said that he saw a paper that said it was not a necessity and it was giving parents anxiety. I've yet to see in the study. We are doing them in the NICU, but not in the maternity unless there is a medical need. I'm happy to answer based on our policy. We don't ha we don't have a minimum weight where they're required either. Um, there have been some differing studies on um, when that might or might not be necessary, but the general recommendation is to do them and to follow the policy of the organization. Um, the AAP currently does not have a specific weight listed in their policy recommendations. And I will be completely transparent in that our institution has very differing opinions based on attendings, units, um, floors, all the things. Um, so it's very, um, it's very interesting and it is becoming more controversial, I guess the topic has been in our, in our hospital. Um, so we have a, a board that's actually like convening to like kind of review the, we don't even call it a policy. It's a set of guidelines. So um, we are, we're reviewing it right now as a group, but there's a lot of differing opinions and a lot of headbutting going on. And the two hospitals I worked at were the same. We did not have a minimum weight for the CSTS. Um, it was based on gestational age and other medical needs they may have. Yeah. Um, another person said they use the 2,500 gram rule for testing. So if the baby's under 2,500 grams, they do the testing. And then there is one question. Anybody know where I can get a special needs car seat for a larger toddler with autism? Christy, if you want to email me at secretary at cpsboard.org, I can connect you with somebody in your area for that to do an assessment. Phew, a lot of questions. Did we miss any? Anybody else have anything they want to say? There were a couple of hands up. Can you put the back? Oh, the webinars, yes. There you go. And I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording. I'm gonna to to stop sharing and stop recording. Sorry, everybody. <laughs>